All right, well, uh, let's get started with this fabulous, bizarre experiment in learning. Um, I'll show you all. Uh, this is a bit uh, strange for me, and I guess it's pretty strange for you. I hope you're doing okay. I um, want to check in on that uh, particularly, but the, the first thing I just wanted to think about, you know, because we talk a lot about as every time I come to class, I think, oh, there's something to be learned out of whatever's going on in the world right now. <clears throat> and one of the things that is going on is we're all not moving around very much. And as many of you may have seen, there have been reports saying that greenhouse gas emissions are way down in, first of all, it was in China, and now it's in Italy and in Spain, but now also in North America, because we're driving around so much less, because we're staying at home, there's uh, a lot less pollution being caused by our movement. Um, now, there's still food being moved around, and there's still all sorts of things in trucks, but for the most part, people are driving a lot less. Uh, a lot of different public transportation systems are moving around a lot less. And so even in the midst of this kind of terrible situation, we've got some really positive things coming out of it as well, including the sort of reduction of our waste and pollution. And maybe we're also being less wasteful with food now too, because we're not as it's not as easy to go out and get it all the time. So one of the things to sort of think about possibly is how sustainability is much related to movement and I said this I think at one point in class but that because of the way we move ourselves and our food around the planet that's one of the producers of unsustainable practices and um, not that we want to live in lockdown all the time but it's a very good uh, that's well, a good indicator it's a good piece of data about how much we actually can make a difference in the world if we change individual behaviors. And then that's the other piece of this. Of course, we're all saying stay home so that you don't get sick, but mostly stay home so that you don't make other people sick. And that's also kind of fundamental to this whole idea of sustainability, is that we do stuff not always for ourselves, but for the collective good. And this is why the, the politicians are getting very angry right now at people who are coming back from, say, Florida and not self-isolating immediately because they they think they're just just taking one little thing for themselves. They're just going to go shopping or they're just going to pick up their dog from the kennel or they're just going to go visit their kids. But in doing that just one thing, um, it has potentially really damaging effects for the, the, the health of the community and the health of our community is sustainability. Um, so in this in this case we've got a really good example of how making individual choices can actually have really big effects, positive and negative, on the rest of our community. And as I said, I think uh, at the end of the class on on uh, last well, two weeks ago, here we've got an example that we can learn from that sustainability is not obvious and you don't always see the effects directly and it may not even benefit you directly but it will eventually benefit you because it's benefiting the health of the whole system and that's what's so hard to grasp about public health or about sustainability or about waste reduction that it never seems big the actions that we do in the in the moment but then they have other effects and they have effects on all sorts of people and all sorts of places that we don't expect. So anyway, that's what I was thinking about this morning. Um, for this class, uh, it'll probably be a bit of a shorter class than usual. I'm gonna, you know, my mission for the next uh, four weeks is to get through this material, uh, get you to learn as much as you need to to pass this course with the marks that you want, uh, but also to make it um, not difficult for any of us because this is a very difficult situation already. So um, that's the goal. Um, what I'm gonna do is show some slides as usual, talk about them. Um, hopefully you'll have some questions that you can pose in chat. If you're, uh, if you're not comfortable talking out loud in class, this is a perfect opportunity for you to send me messages in, in the chat and we can, uh, I'll respond to them and then we can have a sort of conversation that way. Um, if uh, there are technical problems, if you can't hear me, uh, either raise your hand, with the button at the bottom of your screen, the little image of the person going like this. Um, if you, if that doesn't work, or if I don't see your message uh, in the chat, because I will have to be manipulating a few things on my screen, 
So if I don't hear you or see you, just turn on your microphone and say something out loud so that I can stop and pay attention because that's going to be, you know, ordinarily I'd be able to see you in class raising your hand or wanting to speak. But in this case, we're going to have to rely on the, the technical, uh, the digital opportunities. So anyway, just shout out, turn on your microphone if you need to. Otherwise, keep your mics off so that we don't hear a lot of background noise. But anytime that you do want to say something, just either turn it on or send a message in chat because we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't let this technology get in our way too much. The session is going to be recorded, so I've got it recording right now. Um, just be aware of that. I'm doing that so that people who aren't in the class right now can uh, still hear the presentation, and, um, and we'll see how it goes. And if we need to make modifications for next week, we will. Uh, it may be better that I record these, you watch them, and then we come and meet together for an hour and talk to each other and pose questions. I don't know. So we'll, we'll figure this out as we go along a bit. Um, so I'll show you some slides. Uh, there will be moments when I take a break and I send you a link to a video to watch. Um, I won't show the video through Blackboard because it'll take up too much bandwidth. Um, and there have been problems with that before. So uh, we'll take breaks to look at the videos separately on your own computers or your own devices. And then we'll come back as soon as the video is over and continue on with the discussion. And I'll take a break at uh, about an hour into the class, and hopefully we'll be done at about uh, 11 o'clock uh, Eastern time. I'm assuming you're all still in Toronto. Anyway, um, on we go. Anyone have any questions about any of the things that I've just said? No. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> OK. All right. And do uh, do just drop those into the chat, any messages, any questions, any requests, uh, or raise your hand. How do I? OK, so I can raise my, I know how to raise my hand, but uh, I may not see you if you raise your hand. So best thing to do is send a message in chat or say something out loud with your microphone back on. So the first thing I want to do is go through, actually, the revised uh, course outline. It is posted up on um, Blackboard, uh, but there may be some clarifications that I can make doing this. So I'm just going to go through this. Uh, there we go. I'm going to go through this quickly. It's just a few things, mostly with regard to how we're dividing up the uh, evaluation points, because of course we've missed a week. Um, if you have seen the announcement in Blackboard, you'll know that the um, pledge assignment is no longer part of this course. So if you have completed it and submitted it, um, I will figure out a way to readjust the marks so that you can maybe um, uh, not have to do something else in the course or will balance points in some other way. Anyway, we'll figure that out. But for the time being, um, if you haven't done the pledge assignment, don't do it because it's not part of it. So, OK, well, Julian, we'll, <laughs> we'll figure that out. Um, you can, well, anyway, anyone who submitted already, I, I will see that in the grading area. Um, so for those of you who have submitted it, did you not see the announcement or did the announcement not make sense? Uh, because we posted that, I posted that as soon as I heard that we weren't going to be having a pledge assignment. Because of course, this is, course is being taught by a few other professors as well. Anyway, we'll sort that out. Sorry about that, but um, there are some opportunities for you to get that. Oh, well, <laughs> the emojis are going to make me laugh, so keep sending those. Um, all right, so here we are. Classes were canceled for week three. Week four, which is what we're in right now, will actually be a combination of week three's and week four's topics, which are policy and profit. So they've been uh, compressed a bit. Uh, we're going to have um, a mini quiz that you can complete. And uh, that will be, in some ways, a replacement for the pledge assignment. So each week, I'll have a very small exercise in class that's going to allow you to get some extra points. So again, if you've done the pledge assignment, you can either choose not to do those uh, extra, extra exercises in class, and, or you can do the exercises, and then I'll take the best mark out of, out of the two, or we'll figure something else out. Uh, but that's, uh, that's uh, what's going to happen. So we'll have these little additional exercises. The online discussion boards are also a place that you can participate. Um, they're uh, linked to, in the, in the left-hand section of the Blackboard, you can see those places 
what does it look like? So it's right underneath, right above the, the collaborate link is the online discussions link, and that's another place that you can contribute ideas and, and conversations. Uh, the final exam will uh, take place in the last class. Um, so because the final exam was meant to take place in the George Brown Evaluation Center or Test Center, and that's of course closed, we're going to have something which we'll figure out, uh, the professors who are teaching this course are meeting either tomorrow or early next week to figure out what the new exam will look like. Um, it can't be the same as the old exam because that, that was uh, geared for specifically taking in the evaluation center. So there will be a final exam. It'll take place in the final class. So you don't need to have any, you don't need to plan any separate time for that. Um, it'll just be built into that. And I'll be doing some review for that exam in whatever that exam looks like in this in week six so anyway here we are week four doing policy and profit as the themes um, i'll talk about the checklist assignment the checklist is now due in week six so that is before the exam week um, next week we'll talk about food systems um, as a whole and uh, some part of ethics and ethical practices and then also in week six we'll continue the ethics question and also get into um, exam review and then uh, on week seven the last day of this course on april 16th we'll have the final exam and i may have some additional case studies to share with you some very positive uplifting hopeful examples but again we'll figure that out uh, a little bit closer to the final that week because at this point we just don't know exactly what the final exam will look like. Uh, so that's the, the sort of overview. The major changes obviously pledge assignment no longer due and the checklist assignment is now due in week six rather than week seven um, and I'll go through that checklist assignment again today so you can ask questions and we can figure out uh, if there are any outstanding issues there. Just looking at the chat briefly. Okay. All right, so do keep an eye on the announcements section. Things are changing every day for all of us in all sorts of ways. So I will be posting there uh, if anything changes, if there are any new updates, uh, as soon as I know stuff. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not the only one in charge of this course. We're all trying to balance with each other, the other, the other instructors. So um, we're constantly chatting about how to make this course work and how to, how to keep it going uh, in a roughly equivalent way for all the students who are in it. Any questions on the um, on that uh, the revised course outline and what the new structure is or what the new schedule is? No questions. Okay. Great. This is going to be fun. Let's let's continue on. I feel like I'm just chatting to my computer. Of course, you're all there, but it, it doesn't necessarily feel like it when I can't see your faces. All right, um, back to the slides. So there was a couple of uh, subjects from week two on people. So I'm going to go back to that presentation. <coughs> we covered most of it, but I just want to get back to a couple of the questions about basically community food centers. These are a few other definitions. Again, um, I was teaching you definitions before for the final exam. Final exam is probably gonna be something like short answers and multiple choice. But again, we're trying to figure that out. So the definitions still matter, but um, maybe a little bit less of a focus on them. So where are I going? So the, ah oh yes, here we go. So. This is, a, this is an, again, back to week two. Uh, and Joshna Maharaj is a kind of fabulous woman uh, who has done an enormous amount with mostly institutional uh, food work. So she's worked uh, in hospitals and schools and other institutions. Prison food is one of the themes that she talks about a lot. And the importance of creating sustainable food practices in um, in, in big institutions, because that's very often where sustainability gets left behind, particularly questions of things like uh, health and nutrition, and flavor and pleasure. So a lot of the cultural sustainability issues come up when you're dealing with institutional food. And so she's done tons of work to um, both 
make institutions and their administration understand that food is a critical part of the well-being of the people who are part of that institution. And you can imagine in prison, um, food is, is really super critical for people's not just physical health, but psychological and emotional health. And also it's a place where people who are coming from a whole bunch of different backgrounds probably aren't really comfortable eating the same thing. So that's been a big challenge. But certainly hospitals, hospital food is, is traditionally known as really terrible. Um, but it's also known that when hospital food is both culturally appropriate to the people eating it and um, interesting and good tasting, uh, it helps people get better physically much faster. So if your emotional health is stronger, your physical health will come back faster. Uh, there's a professor here in Montreal who's worked a lot with the Chinese hospital in uh, downtown Montreal, um, and it's right in Chinatown, usually for the Chinese community. Uh, one of the issues there was they were being, the patients were being fed things that had nothing to do with Chinese cuisine. And so if you're you know, a 70 or 80 year old Chinese person in hospital, with some condition that's being treated, either a surgery or some other condition, and you're being made to eat things like you know, chicken breast and jello pudding, and all these weird kind of Western industrialized foods, but you grew up eating rice and vegetables and pork, uh, you would probably not want to eat that food and you probably wouldn't get healthy as, as quickly. Um, and so what this professor did was created a rooftop garden actually at the hospital where uh patients but also staff were growing uh vegetables of chinese origin. so things like eggplants and the and spring onions and all sorts of other vegetables that might go into a chinese dish now there's obviously a ton of different kinds of chinese cuisine but at least that effort started to make the patients feel like they were being served food that was familiar even if it wasn't exactly like their own home cooking and suddenly people started getting better much faster. So that kind of work is also what Joshna supports. <clears throat> and it's really about thinking about food in that, in that way that we discussed last or two weeks ago, um, about sovereignty, that being empowered, being in power and in charge of your own food, in charge of making decisions for yourself, um, sourcing your food, cooking it, eating it, all of those things are part of what makes food good for you. It's not just about nutritional content. It's not just about eating a number of calories. It's actually about eating what's culturally right. And so that comes into that question of cultural sustainability. Um, so Joshna talks a lot about that as well. She's very interested in people practicing food beyond just buying and eating it, but in sourcing it, in growing it, in sharing it with other people. And so this is, these are some of her messages, things like eating locally ties us to a place. And it connects us to the community around us. And so right now, even you know, good examples, as we find ourselves being disconnected from other people, we find ourselves being really, you know, disconnected from ourselves as well. I recognize I'm I'm thinking and feeling completely differently than I have over the last two weeks. Well, over the last two weeks, I've been feeling different than my normal self, just because I haven't talked to my I haven't been with my friends, I've talked to them, but I haven't actually connected in the same way. And I'm imagining many of you are feeling the same way. In the same way, connecting with food is that means of connecting to other people. So this is why Joshna is so interested in, in local, not just because it's environmentally sustainable, but because it's socially sustainable. It builds that relationship that allows us to feel well and allows us to relate to other people. And this goes beyond just, oh, it's better than transporting food from far away. So. Here we come with. Uh, here are some of the examples of how uh, how sustainable, how local food, or what Josh calls better food relationships, um, support a variety of kinds of sustainability. So, in the first uh, area, let's see if I can point to it. Here, maybe I can draw on it. There, the joy of cooking and eating together. So that's that idea of cultural sustainability, social connectivity. Um, that here, when she talks about youth, youth being armed with cooking skills and a pocket of family recipes, that's also about sustainability from one generation to the next, where traditions and knowledge are being passed on. And it's not just about um, cooking what comes out of the supermarket, but cooking what comes out of your community, what comes out of your culture. Of course, um, better food relationships support farmers. 
Um, it's good for their economic sustainability. <clears throat> it's good for their sense of connection to the world. Now, when we talk about farmers, obviously we're talking about real human beings working on the land as opposed to giant corporate farms, which also have human beings, but also a lot of technologies. Um, we've got environmental sustainability. Once again, agricultural land that's renewed by ecological growing, but also gratitude. And that sounds a little bit new age, the idea of being grateful to the land. But it's actually very true that if you pay attention to the land because you're grateful for it, you will probably be a better steward of the land. You'll be taking care of it. You'll be making sure that it's less susceptible to environmental damage. Um, you'll be using fewer pesticides and fertilizers. So there's something very important about that connection. And that's, again, why we were talking about uh, indigenous food systems two weeks ago, because that, excuse me, that strong connection between land, food, culture, identity, and individual people is what makes indigenous food systems more sustainable. It's not just about extracting resources, it's about being part of the place in order to make that place more healthful. And then thriving communities, again, we come back to this idea of social sustainability. And right now we're in a period of not very sustainable society because we're so disconnected from each other. We'll have to see, we'll have to remake that sustainability um, once this shutdown is, is over. But um, that's something to, to also to pay attention to is that we, we are stronger together and we are more human when we're in relationship with other humans. And that's one of the things that's gonna be coming out of this, this crisis, I think, right now. So one of the ways that those better food relationships have been activated in past is through um, th these things called community food centers. And there's an organization called Community Food Centers Canada, and the link is here. Um, the name is there. <coughs> All right, I'm gonna lose my voice early today. Um, and the community food centers are about making food more part of daily life, not just, as I said, not just purchasing or procuring it and then cooking it and eating it, but also being in the processes of, of making, maybe even growing it in some places if you've got an urban garden. And so a community food center takes um, the, the, the need that has been filled by food banks in the past and places it in a bigger context. So let's just see, uh, it's not a great slide, but you can, <clears throat> you can see here, um, I'll circle some of the words that uh, the Community Food Centers of Canada try to focus on. So they've got education is a major part of it. It's not just about a food bank delivering a basket of food to a family in need, but about teaching them how to cook, what to do with those ingredients, um, how to uh, think through food, how to have relationships through food. It's about equality, so making sure that everybody, uh, whatever social or economic class, has access to food, has access to good food, food that's helpful for them, both culturally and physically. It's about engagement, and engagement is this funny word that means um, getting involved, not just as I said, not just eating, but getting involved with the food. So the community food centers try to make sure that people are, are actually maybe cooking together, maybe coming together to learn how to cook, a few things like that. Two of the other key words for community food centers are dignity and hope. And so historically, when food banks were created, it was really just about making sure people had calories in their bodies but they weren't always paying attention to this issue of dignity. And of course, if you are in need, it can be embarrassing sometimes to admit it, to say, I need help. And food banks haven't always paid attention to that question when they're sending out their food or making their food accessible. Making it feel dignified to go into a place where you're receiving free food is part of what the food centers are about. And some food banks do this as well, very well. But the idea that it should be socially dignified and hopeful and positive to go and get that food rather than uh, produce a feeling of shame or a social embarrassment or something else. So sustainability is right there. We've talked about that a few times. Health, absolutely. The community food centers are still very focused on making sure the food is good for the body and good for the mind, uh, not just calories to keep, keep you moving through the day.
And community. So again, where a food bank might be some place that you go and pick up a basket or a box of food, a community food center is about coming together and staying there for a while, maybe to learn something about cooking, maybe to share a story, maybe to get some support of other kinds, um, maybe to get some psychological counseling, maybe to be helped to find a job um, or to find an apartment or to find something else that's associated with your lack of food. And then down here in the corner, prevention. It's also about preventing either food-related illnesses or preventing other kinds of uh, maybe substance abuse or physical situations that are bad for you or that you're creating for others. So what food centers are also looking at doing is, is creating a bigger sort of social safety net around and related to food. So this is a very, it's a very distinct kind of structure. The Community Food Centers of Canada is the big organization, but there are other smaller organizations that are more independent. Um, you can look at some of these figures uh, later if you want, but they clearly are demonstrating that people who participate in community food centers um, are, are doing better uh, across the board. They are, they are getting healthful food, they're changing their diets, they're improving their physical health, they're improving their mental health particularly. That's what's interesting, the 70% of people who've been to a community food center say that they've experienced improvements in their mental health. And that's a big deal for people who are living um, in less economically comfortable ways. 80% um, of them said they made a new friend, 65% said they met someone they can count on. So, you know, these are really important aspects of what the community food centers do beyond just delivering food. So I said they're smaller, uh, more independent organizations, Centre pour Roulin is one that's here in Montreal. And it's a, it's a funny organization that's evolved over time. There's a cafe. It used to be a bike shop. Uh, the bike shop then turned into what we call a Meals on Wheels program. So this is where people would deliver cooked meals to other people who couldn't get out of their houses. So either people who maybe had a chronic medical condition or uh, elderly who were less able to move around and buy food for themselves, particularly in the winter when the streets are very snowy and icy, Central Pole be able to deliver food directly to their homes and also make sure that they're doing okay and not too shut in. So right now, you know, this is something that we're all experiencing, but for many people, they experience it year round where they're not connected to people, they're, they're too physically frail to, to move around, or they're just shut in for a period of time while they, are experiencing an illness. So what was great about it being a bike shop is that the meals were being delivered on two wheels, not on four, and all of the volunteers who work for Centre Pole would bike the meals to different people's houses. So that's why the bike shop was an integral part of Centre Pole at the beginning. But now Centre Pole has grown even more. It's now got a giant community kitchen where people can cook together, uh, where people can make large quantities of food and share it, so it's very economically advantageous. Uh, but then it's also got a small farmer's market, it's got a rooftop garden, it's got uh, beehives on the roofs, and they're doing education about urban gardening. And in fact, the street in front of the Central Pole headquarters has now been shut down permanently and is a kind of community park or garden. Of course, no one's there right now. But, um, but it's a whole block of the street that's been closed off and it's been turned into an education center and just hangout space for people to come and meet each other and, and be together. But you can see the plants growing in the raised beds and you can learn about urban gardening and things. So it's a, it's a very interesting, again, like, like the Community Food Centers of Canada, it's a very multi, what, multi-dimensional service uh, providing, yes, food services, but also a bunch of other things that are related to food. Centre Pole is now also uh, creating uh, gardening and agriculture courses so that you can go out of the city, learn about agriculture, learn about things like permaculture, and uh, maybe bring that back into the city and have your own very small little balcony full of good fruits and vegetables. So those um, those are the main points that I wanted to get to from uh, last week or from two weeks ago. Uh, so here again, on the last slide, of, or it's, it's within the slides of, uh, of week two, this definition of what community food centers is. They call it a welcome space in a low-income neighborhood where people come together to grow, cook, and share, and advocate for good food, providing people with access to high-quality food in a dignified space. So that kind of sums it up, and it's a lot like the definition of food sovereignty we also saw two weeks ago, in which it's 
not just about access to food, but it's healthy and culturally appropriate food. It's produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods, and it's the right to define your own food and agriculture systems. So it's not just food access and having food in the calorie format, but it's actually food that makes sense for who you are as a person, not just as a body. And then also that it needs to be produced in good ways. And it's the right to define things. It's the sense of power and authority over your own food. So it's very similar. This food sovereignty is very similar in many ways to what community food centers are trying to do, um, is create a very holistic approach to good food in the human body. All right. That's week two, wrapped up. <laughs> Let's get on to week four. Um, uh, not bypassing week three, of course. So I'm gonna go and look at the week three uh, slides now. Is anyone got any questions or any comments about what the community food centers? None. All right, don't hesitate to just pop in comments anytime and I can respond to them in the middle of uh, what I'm talking about because if it's a little bit more interactive for you, it'll probably be a little bit more interesting for you. Okay. All right, so week three. It's almost easier navigating this technology than the in-class technology, but I don't know. All right, week three, looking at policy. And policy is a weird... Um, of all, all, of all the aspects of sustainability, policy is perhaps really necessary and also um, sometimes hardest to understand. So we're gonna do a couple of little maybe exercises right now to see uh, what that actually means. But there is a comment. Why prices differ for groceries in the community as opposed compared to local groceries? So do you mean um, when you're, when you're buying groceries uh, at a grocery store or at a supermarket, why the prices might be different than where? So difference between prices in the grocery store and what other place? When you say groceries in the community, what do you mean? Um, all right, not getting a response, but oh yeah. Own, own community centers. So the uh, well, there are a couple of things that are going on there. One, the those uh, community food centers um, are subsidized by different sources of funding. So they may be receiving municipal funding from the city. They may be getting funding at a at a higher level, say at the national level. But the community food centers and food banks. I mean, food banks rely on donations from people who have lots of money. So for someone who has access to basically money or fruits and vegetables or preserved foods or dried foods, they will take them to the food bank and that's a donation to the food bank. And then the food bank redistributes it to um, all the people in the community who need it, who don't have money to pay for the food themselves. So the food bank's giving away free food. Um, and that's why, and so the cost is zero to the consumer. The consumer is just receiving a donation from other people. Um, but that's why it would cost much less, uh, or in fact, nothing, if you're getting food from a community food center because it's been paid for by someone else. Uh, food centers and food banks also sometimes receive donations from uh, supermarkets or from restaurants. There's always the question of food safety, whether the food is safe to eat uh, because it's been processed or kept cold or kept hot in the right way. But um, those are also donations, which is why that doesn't cost anything to receive food from the food bank or from the community food center. But then a, a, a sort of a larger question, why, why do prices differ? Uh, well, those are all the, the complications of markets and what business is looking for what kind of profit. So uh, very often, supermarket food will cost less than food at say a farmer's market because they're selling food at a larger scale so that's where we talk about the economies of scale we'll get into this um, in the, the second part of this class on profit but when you're making when you're selling you know a hundred units of food versus one unit of food you can afford to make less profit on each of those hundred units because you're selling a hundred of them 
Um, you're also probably buying from industrial food suppliers who are themselves making uh, larger amounts of food and therefore can uh, have less profit per unit. Um, and then if you're buying it directly from the farmer at a farmer's market, um, because the scale of production is smaller, it's also going to be um, more expensive for that individual to produce the food and then more expensive for the consumer to buy it as well. Uh, do most community centers run as nonprofit organizations? I believe they do. Uh, food banks almost always do. There's very little profit in the business in any case, um, and they do depend on donations, not just of food, but also of money. So their administrative costs or their staff costs uh, have to be paid for by donations. Um, and so they wouldn't be running as profitable organizations. There might be some coming on right now because food, or because people are in food crisis, but it would certainly be immoral to have a for-profit food bank or a food community center. So I do know that the, the food centers of Canada um, are non it's a nonprofit organization. Um, which is good. That's the way it should be. Um, and in fact, they, they also rely on a huge amount of volunteer labor. Um, so that's one of the things that's happening right now also, just to relate it back to our current context. Food banks um, have been having a really hard time um, at this, at this in the last two weeks because so often the people who run the banks who are there to hand out the food and be the administrators are volunteers. And a lot of them are senior citizen volunteers. And because People over 70 are being told to stay in their homes 100% uh, of the time. They can't go out and volunteer, so the food banks are sometimes have only 50% of their staff. So it's become a real issue. At a time when the food banks are even more important than they were before, they have even fewer people to run them because many of those people are senior citizens. In community food centers, we won't find every food we're looking for. No, that's correct. Um, so food banks generally, don't have a lot of fresh food because they have to be able to store the food for a week or so. They don't always have refrigeration. And so that's one of the problems with food banks and community food centers is that they tend to rely on packaged foods, uh, things that aren't going to go bad, They're basically shelf stable foods. Um, so a lot of pasta and beans and things like that. But of course, people need fresh food as well. So this is something that food banks and community food centers have been working on doing is figuring out how to make more fresh foods fruits and vegetables and fresh things like uh, meat and cheese and milk, uh, particularly milk, making that available as well. Another big challenge. All right, we could, we could go on about that for quite a long time, but I'm going to move on to the next section. Um, if you have questions, pop them into the chat and I will try to answer them in text during a break. All right. Um, so policy, as I said, policy is a, a weird um, space of, of very confusing to some people, uh, but in many ways it's actually very simple. Um, so I'll get into what a policy is, but I just want to start with a few, a few slides about what policy has an effect on. And again, some of these slides are on the depressing side of uh, food sustainability, but they're also useful things to learn about. These are also very useful maybe for your final checklist assignment. Keep that always in mind is that every time we talk about some part of sustainability, particularly when it comes to food produ production, you can be taking notes for the checklist assignment. So a feed conversion ratio is maybe something that you can include on that checklist. It means how much food, how much um, input is required in order to produce an, an amount of output. And the, feed the higher the feed conversion ratio is, uh, mean, it means uh, a less sustainable production process. So for example, a um, little bit hard to read, but you can see down here in this corner, the feed conversion says kilograms of feed divided by the kilograms of edible weight, and that's the edible food weight. So for milk, for example, 0.7 kilograms of feed is required to produce one kilogram of milk. So that's a very good uh, feed conversion ratio. That's a very low food feed conversion ratio, which means that milk is a more efficient food product than some other things. For fish, it takes 2.3 kilograms of feed to produce one kilogram of edible fish uh, flesh. So, or of edible fish material. So that's that's saying that it basically takes double the amount of food to make one amount of fish that humans can eat. 
So that's getting towards like, okay, well, that's not bad, but that's still kind of surprising. Chicken, it's about four. Pork, it's about 10. And beef is about 32, 31.5. And so this is why we talk about the problems with eating beef. It's not just because it's producing a lot of greenhouse gas. It's not just because we clear cut the land to make uh, feedlots for our cows, but it's because it takes 32 kilograms of feed to make one kilogram of beef. And that means that it's a very, it's a very high feed conversion ratio. It means it's a very inefficient food production system. And that's also very unsustainable because all that feed that we're talking about is grain, basically. So if you actually just ate the grain, then you'd be eating, that's a one-to-one -one feed conversion ratio. If you're eating beef, you're eating basically 32 kilograms of grain every time you eat a kilogram of beef. And we'll get into what that means in terms of costs later on. Yeah, so the nutrition level differs uh, between milk, milk and beef, but certainly doesn't differ that much between, say, soy and beef. Um, and so this is why so much of our thinking around alternatives to meat are directed towards things like using soybeans or using uh, peas or other legumes, because those have very high nutritional value compared to beef. So yeah, you're, and, and you know, and there's also the value in eating beef. It tastes great. It's a symbol of power. Uh, in some cultures, it's, it's very central to their cultural identity. Um, but it also means that just in terms of, yeah, the beef and mealworms would be an interesting question. Um, and that's, of course, why a lot of people are turning to insects, because insects have a very, very low feed conversion ratio. Um, and that's one of the reasons that we're looking to these alternative sources of protein and alternative meats, maybe if we're talking about clean meat or, or lab-grown meat or beyond beef type meat. Um, so there's a lot of different reasons to look at that. And there's also reasons to continue to eat beef, but in moderation and with the knowledge of how much grain it actually consumes or how much resource it also consumes. Because it's not just grain, it's also water. Um, animal production is incredibly water intensive. So that's another thing which we'll look at uh, later on in the slide. So just a quick map to visualize how uh, we eat meat around the world. The darker areas are more meat consuming intensive. So the very darkest areas like the United States and Australia, Spain um, is between, what is it, 103 to 137 kilograms of meat. That's all meat, not just beef, per person per year. That's an enormous amount <coughs> relative to, see, places in Africa, India, uh, a lot of Indonesia, that so there and there and in these countries, except for whichever country that is. So very much less meat consumed in those regions. And you see that it's often the wealthier countries like Europe and North America and Australia that are doing more of the meat eating. Uh, question. As the plant-based protein is in trend, how has the number has increased or decreased? That's a good question. I don't know, actually. Um, I, we do know that meat consumption around the world is going up, uh, particularly pork. Pork is the number one meat that's loved best around the world. Beef may be considered most, um, <clears throat> excuse me, most noble in way, in a way, but many countries don't eat beef. Uh, certainly. A lot of the Indian continent or Indian subcontinent does not eat beef, whereas uh, pork uh, is incredibly popular in a lar very large number of countries, particularly in China, where pork production, pork consumption has gone up as uh, individual wealth has gone up. So we're creating these alternatives, but it's probably uh, not having a massive effect global, globally yet partly because adoption is a process and partly because meat is always going to be a symbol of power and uh, and pleasure. So people will keep wanting to uh, uh, can keep wanting to continue, continue eating it. Sorry, someone had their hand up, put it down again. Anyway, yeah, I think the chat is the best way to pose questions because I'm not obviously seeing everyone's hand when they go up. All right, next. So just as a reminder, as we continue to talk about sustainability, it's this idea of meeting our own needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. It's not just about the future generations, but it's about other places on the planet. So as I've said a few times, sustainability is about doing something here and now that doesn't prevent other people from doing something later or elsewhere. And so that's those are the two the major 
ideas about sustainability is it's about time and place and not doing something or doing something that's not going to limit other people from doing it either now or later. All right, so today <clears throat> I'm going to look a bit at this idea of what policy is and how policy works and then also um, how there's some issues in food that are specifically driven or affected by policy. Some of the definitions that we will look at, um, food desert, this is a big thing, food security, we've talked a bit about food policies, certifications also, and um, green space, and that's meant to be greenwashing. You know, we'll come to those later on, but those are a couple of notes about what to, some of the words to pay attention to as, as we're going through the slides. And one of the things is when we, we talk about, you know, people here and now eating food in a way that is not going to limit people in other places. What's what's notable, and I'm going to show you some slides uh, or some photographs, is that around the world, people eat radically different amounts of food. So the expectation about what is normal is often more is often more surprising than we think. I'm about to so in this Excuse me, in this PowerPoint, um, you can click on what the world eats and see these slides, but I'm about to show it to you um, on a screen, if I can find it. There we go. So this is from The Guardian, which is a newspaper in uh, the United Kingdom, very well-regarded newspaper, does a lot of very smart, progressive reporting. And what this reporter did in 2013 is a pho photographer actually went out to different places in the world and took photographs of the amount of food that a given family in a given country would eat over the course of a week. So I'll just run through these so you can see some of the comparisons. So this is uh, a family in Darfur in, Su in Sudan. Uh, they're in a refugee camp and this is the amount of food that this family of six people will eat in a week. And you see it's that looks like it's rice right there. Oops, I'm not, I can't circle it. But anyway, central bag is rice. And then we've got some, some pulses or some legumes, some beans, some peas, small amount of other things, maybe some cooking oil. That doesn't look like it would feed a family of six in North America. Um, there's a family of four in the United Kingdom. So we also see the amount of money. This is in pounds. So if you double that, you basically get something like a dollar figure. So maybe $320. And this is what the UK family is eating. So you see, whereas we saw in this image, a lot of uh, unprocessed food, obviously there's tons of processed food in this picture. And what I'm curious about is the single bottle of wine that uh, <laughs> this family of four is apparently drinking per week. So there's, there's the family area. And now you can see more clearly there are some looks like limes and some chili peppers, so a few small flavor ingredients, but basically a lot of legumes and rice. And then this is a family in Japan, so a family of three, spending about $280 or $90 a week on food, certainly more, uh, certainly some packaged food, but not as much processed food, it looks like. And I'm just going to go back to the Uh, okay, um, so just uh, can everybody just, or could a couple of people say, yes, we are seeing these, uh, this, uh, the photographs that I'm showing to you. Are you able to see those? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so back to sharing. Oops. All right, so they're, uh, again, just a family from Ecuador, um, fairly rural looking family, a lot of, well, almost no processed food. I don't see any processed food in that image. And this total cost of food is $40. So much less uh, economically well off and much less, um, uh, much less cost in food as well. Here's a family from Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia very meat-oriented, very grain, lots of eggs, 
cost of food about sixty dollars. <throat> Family from Bosnia, cost of food about two hundred. More packaged food, but you see a lot of a lot of bread, a lot of potatoes, a lot of eggs. So it's interesting to see how this this varies from country to country, not just in terms of the you know whether it's processed or whether it's fresh, but also the kinds of food, the very different cuisines that represent this food. This is from a family in Greenland with their weekly groceries costing a lot. What is that? It's about $360 per year, per week rather. And again, a lot of, a lot of meat, some wild meat it looks like, uh, as well as a certain amount of processed food. And that's also partly because, of course, in very northern countries like Greenland, like the northern parts of Canada, like northern Russia, um, uh, North Europe, there's well, much less fresh, fresh fruit available because if there's anything fresh, it's probably been brought in from, uh, from the south. <laughs> All right, I'll go through the, the rest of these quickly. There's a much larger family from uh, Bhutan, um, and there's their food. Again, very unprocessed. And total cost of that food is $7. So very different economics as well. And this is clearly not a family, <coughs> it's a large family, but it's not a family that looks like they're um, in a sort of reduced socioeconomic class. They look relatively well off, but a very low cost of food. And that's also partly because Bhutan is a very progressive country where food is made to be uh, less expensive than in some other places. So there's an Indian family, very vegetable oriented, $50 worth of food. A uh, family from North Carolina in the United States with their happy pizza smiles, um, but again, a very processed uh, display of food. A lot of, uh, a lot of junk food, a lot of uh, certain amount of fruits and vegetables, but a lot of uh, juices in bottles and things like this. And their total cost is much higher, right? $420 per week. Yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, the Bhutan family is, it's, it's interesting to see places around the world where there's a great deal of food, but it's not the kind of food that uh, many of us are used to eating. So in Mali, this very large family spending about $32, $35 a week, but again, a very, very simple looking diet, some certain amount of flavoring elements, a certain amount of fresh fruit and vegetable, but a lot of grain uh, and a lot of uh, likely legumes of some sort. Here's a German family. Beer seems to be a major feature of this family's consumption, as well as bottled water, as well as a lot of processed food, but also a lot of fruits and vegetables. Um, but the price here, 320 pounds, $640 roughly. <clears throat> that's by far the most expensive weekly food budget. And so that's notable as well. That's a very industrialized, uh, successful country, uh, but also with very expensive food. And, and that is it. But that, as a comparison, just gives us a sense of what the realities are around the world and somehow, sometimes how our realities are not as uh, familiar to places that we're, sorry, we're not, so, we're not so aware of the normal for other people in different places around the world. <clears throat> All right. So what is policy? Anyone have an idea? When I say the word policy, what are the first words that come into your minds? Rules. Yeah, <clears throat> rules is one thing. Guidelines, definitely. Other ways to think about it? <clears throat> what do, uh, who puts policies in place? Yeah, legislators. Legislation is, a, is one form of policy. And then who is it who's in charge of making policy? Yeah, politicians, the government. Policy is generally defined by some sort of governmental authority. Um, and that's why policy and, and politics share that root, that root word. So policy can be thought of as, let's see if I can get through this slide quickly. Yeah, there we are. Policy. <coughs> in a very short definition, is a plan. 
It's a plan that is meant to address some sort of problem or challenge. Um, there are some other definitions there. A system of principles to guide decisions, protocols, uh, a set of rules or actions. Um, you might set policy at the governmental level of a country or of a city. You might also set policy within a business. Uh, you might also set policy within a family. So you could say, okay, the policy in this family is no television after nine o'clock or a limited amount of screen time in general, or we all sit down and eat dinner together. So those are kind of policies that are maybe less about governing large scale behavior of people, but about governing what happens within an individual family. And they're guidelines, so they're plans. Generally, they're written down as well. So at the, at the level of government, policies are always written down so that you know exactly what has been agreed to at a certain point in time. And then most importantly, so that they can be communicated to the people that are affected by those policies. So if you have a plan and you never write it down, it's very difficult to share it because if you're, I mean, you could share it out loud, you could talk about it, but if you're trying to communicate it to 30 million people, it has to be in some sort of written form. That also helps it be enforced. So if a plan is written down and it's a legal plan, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an official governmental policy, then it can also be enforced. So right now we've got the situation where different governments at the provincial level are coming up with plans for how to deal with COVID-19. And some of them are saying, okay, we're gonna shut down all non-essential services and we're going to make it legally required for you to go straight home after you've traveled from overseas. But then you have to enforce those. Well, first you have to write them down, then you have to communicate them, and then you have to enforce them. And that's what's proving to be a challenge right now with COVID. But it's also a challenge with some policies where people just didn't know that those policies were in place. So the communication of policy is very important. <clears throat> then the enforcement. And then sometimes, and this is also part of policy, is the need to change policies over time because we see that they're not really working for the large population that they're supposed to be addressing. So policies are, um, are changeable. Um, they are basically rules that are set in place with the understanding that it's might they might be rewritten. And that's necessary because systems change over time and we discover that oh, we need to make these policies stronger or we need to relax these policies because they're too strong. So policy is, is really critical. So if you, can, if you think about, um, there's a sort of jokey question here. What is George Brown's cannabis policy? And in previous classes we've said, well, um, I don't know, let's investigate. But does anybody in this class right now know what George Brown's policy is around smoking pot on campus? Before, I said, my yota, five, six, seven, forty, a chai, but agar wo iki, color kaya to wo sebi a chai. Oops, someone's chatting with their mic on. Okay, um, yeah, so a few of you have responded. What's the, uh, what's the policy on smoking pot? Well, yeah, there's. There's uh, don't do it, and um, and indeed within the building, no smoking is allowed. Right, so that covers. It's not just about smoking uh, marijuana. It's also about smoking any form of tobacco or even vaping. Right, so 50 feet from the building, that that may or may not be uh, the policy on cannabis, but it's definitely almost all public buildings will have a policy saying that you must. Like, in fact, it's usually a city or a governmental policy. So you can't smoke anything within nine meters of the front door. So it's always do it, you can do it, but you, can, you can't do it close to the building. You can't do it in the building at all. So George Brown's cannabis policy is basically the same as the government's, oops, there we go, the government's cannabis policy, which is you can't smoke in public, public places. You can't, um, what? I guess you can smoke in, well, it depends. Actually, different cities have enacted different policies. But some uh, governments will say you can't smoke in a public park. You can, can't smoke inside. You can't smoke in a restaurant. Um, but you also can't smoke in a public park. You can't smoke on the sidewalk. You can't smoke within 100 meters of a school. So these are other kinds of policies that then get followed by different levels of organizations. So you might have a federal policy that says it is legal to smoke cannabis in Canada. And then different 
institutions, whether it's a provincial government or a municipal government or the governing bodies of a college, will enact other policies that have to fit within the governmental policy, but that may make the policy more specific. So yes, you can smoke, you can now consume cannabis in Canada. That's the policy of the government of Canada. And then at the provincial level, you have to be 18 or 21 in order to buy it. You can't smoke it in public. You can't smoke it inside. You can't smoke it here and here and here. And then George Brown might or may not have a policy, depending on whether it needs to be more specific than the Toronto or the Ontario policy. So policies fit within each other as well. That's another aspect of policy. All right, let's... Uh, all right. Uh, do you have something here to share? Yeah, all right, let's take a little break because we're now about an hour into the class. Um, I need to take a break for my voice, but you all might want to take a break and uh, get another hot beverage or run to the washroom. Um, I'll say, let's say, because we're not actually going too far, um, it will make the break about 10 minutes and then regroup here. Um, in the meantime, if you're interested in reading uh, the Food and Agriculture Association, uh, Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations uh, Policy on the Right to Food, I'm going to cut and paste a link into the chat. There you go. And that's a little light reading uh, while we take our break. Anyway, see you all back here in 10 minutes. And if you have questions, actually, now would be a time we could... Uh, have a one-on-one -on -one chat if need be. So feel free to pose questions while we're waiting, while we're pausing.
All right, and we're back. <clears throat> well, hopefully all you are back as well. Um, hard to know when people have left the room. Anyway, um, so back to policy and why policy exists. Um, this is a really related to the question of rights. And rights are, you know, we talk a lot about, I've got the right to, you know, walk down the street without being harassed. Yeah, you do. And that's a kind of moral right. You should be allowed to do that. I've got the right to education because I live in a country that supports that and allows me to have access to it. That's a right. And that's a governmental right. That's a right that's been given to you by a governmental body. So governments in general create the policies that regulate and allow people to have access to different services or uh, experiences, including things like education and, and freedom to vote and access to food in particular. But rights are not inherent to human beings. We don't just have rights from the day we're born because we're a human being. We have rights from the day we're born because we're born into societies that have governments that have created protections for rights and have defined rights in certain ways. Um, but this has not always been the case. And so um, as the United Nations started identifying that there are, of course, millions of places around the world where rights are abused or rights are not respected, they decided it was important to start establishing a policy to support the right to food. And so in that link that I shared with you from the FAO, which I will go to right now, hope um, yeah so the right to food was established in basically 2004 by the FAO the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations to ensure that people around the world um, ha should uh, have the right to food and that their governments are creating policies to support that right so this is this is a little rather long set of policy messages, but what I'm going to show you now, or I'm going to give you a link to, is a three-minute video produced by the FAO on the right to food and why the right to food is important and why it should be supported by policies and, um, and then enforced by the governments that create those policies. So I'm going to drop the link in the chat. And I'm going to ask you to watch this video on your own because if I show it on Blackboard, it'll eat up bandwidth too much. So there is the YouTube link. Um, if you, I'll just uh, let you start watching it now, and then we'll come back to uh, discuss it in about three and a half minutes. So I'm going to turn off my mic and my video so I can watch the video, but you should watch the video at the same time. All right, check back with you in three. And a half.
All right, so I hope you have all finished watching the videos. Anyone still watching? All right, so it looks like you're all back with me. So I'm now, how much has the policy changed since 2016? Fabulous question, I have no idea. Um, but you can see what, what has happened over the course of time. So 1948 was when um, food was first recognized as a human right in the Declaration of Human Rights. So that's 1948, right after World War II. Then time goes, time goes, time goes. 2004, uh, the, sorry, in 2004, the FAO member nations adopt the voluntary guidelines to support that access to food, that the right to food should be real. And then in, what is it, 2017, uh, we've got 166 states now uh, signing this accord and agreeing that this should be a policy that's activated at the federal level. So you can see there's this, there's this relationship between um, what should be happening, what is incorporated into another policy like food is a human right, in 1948, but it's not until 2004, 2016, 2017 that we end up having action being taken on it as more and more it's recognized that this may be a right, but it's not, <coughs> excuse me, there's no policy that is supporting it as a right. So declaring it a right is one thing, but making the policies that are communicated and enforced is a whole other part of what is in involved in, in making policies support access and privilege and experience. In that video, you heard uh, one of the speakers mention this as a, as a policy, a model for policy making at the United Nations, which is PANTHER, um, an acronym standing for Participation, Accountability, Non-Discrimination, Transparency, Human Dignity, Empowerment, and the Rule of Law. And so it's a way to start understanding how policy making isn't just, say, one person, coming up with a rule that they think is important and putting it in place. But it's about participation from many people, so many different voices uh, with many different experiences to come together to create a policy that then makes sense for many different people. Uh, but then also all sorts of things like non-discrimination and transparency where it's clear why these policies are being put in place so that they are not discriminating against some groups while benefiting others. And then things like human dignity and empowerment, which are what we talked about earlier, what I talked about earlier with the Canadian uh, food community centers, uh, community food centers, um, is that it's not just about protecting rights, but protecting rights in ways that uh, make people feel well, empowered, prideful, and not creating policies that uh, are intended to produce shame or embarrassment. And then the final one, rule of law, is policy actually has to be enforceable. And in that sense, there has to be punishment for breaking those policies as well. Some kind of disincentive to all those who might want to not follow the policy. So that's, that's a model. Um, Vandana Shiva is, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna skip over this because it doesn't address policy quite so much, but she's an interesting figure. Uh, she is a physicist and a seed saver and a big environmental agricultural activist based in India, um, very, very focused on biodiversity um, and very uh, has a very powerful voice in the world of food and sustainability. But she's someone you can take a look at later. Um, and there she is, surrounded by her seeds. Uh, Navdanya is this organization, a network of seed keepers and organic producers in India. So, so policy, so as, as you may know also, policy, um, so the, there's been a new trade agreement created between Canada, the United States, and Mexico. There was an old one called NAFTA, which stood for the North American Free Trade Agreement. And the new policy is called the USMCA, which is the United States, Mexico, and Canada Trade Agreement. Um, but trade agreements always interact with policies. Um, and this is one of the real challenges is if different countries have different policies around food production and consumption, then it's sometimes quite difficult to create a trade agreement because those policies can be in conflict with each other. 
So this is just these are just some of the cases where different policies around supply management, uh, which Canada has, and environmental and health standards, which differ from country to country, and difference or differences around procurement. So the importance of local procurement versus international exchange of products. All of these policies are different for Mexico and Canada and the United States, and it produces big problems when you're trying to negotiate a trade agreement. Um, so <clears throat> as a, a, just a little bit of a case study and why this is so challenging, say, between the United States and Canada, for dairy um, in the United States, there is massive overproduction. So there's a huge amount of milk being produced in the United States that then has to find a market somehow, either in the form of yogurt or other uh, processed dairy products or in the form of exports. In Canada, we've got supply management, which means that the amount that's produced at the farm is very carefully controlled so that we don't create a surplus. And so that those two are in conflict. Those two systems don't agree with each other. There's my, <laughs> my very bad drawing. Um, and so when Canada and the United States were negotiating dairy as part of the free trade agreement, it became very, very complicated. Anyway, then there are all sorts of other issues. In the United States, it is legal to use recombinant bovine growth hormone, which increases the uh, production of milk in cows. It makes American dairy cows highly productive. But in Canada, RBGH is not allowed in the production of milk, in the production of any animals. So those two policies are in contradiction with each other. And again, you create this divide between the standards that Canada has and the standards the United States has, making the creation of a free trade agreement very difficult. So policy has these interesting effects, not just in terms of what happens within a country, but what can happen between countries as well. So in, when was it, 2003, I forget now exactly when it was, um, there was this organization called Food Secure Canada, who I mentioned two weeks ago, um, who started what was called the People's Food Policy of Canada. And it involved thousands and thousands and thousands of people across Canada, ordinary citizens, participating in the creation of a national food policy. Because up until that time, there had never been a national food policy for Canada. There had been agricultural policies, there were trade policies, but there weren't uh, there wasn't an overarching food policy. And so uh, at that point, this organization, Food Secure Canada, thought, we need, to, we need to get this going. We need to activate this because there are real needs in different parts of this country for an overarching food policy. And some of that was recognizing how important food is to health. Some of that was recognizing how different the indigenous and northern communities of Canada how different their experience when it comes to food is because they have far less access in the North to fresh food. Um, there was also questions of things like labeling and communications and food literacy, food literacy being the way that we as individual consumers can read and understand both food packaging, but also what even like the nutrition label means. So these were all questions that had never been addressed by one overarching policy. Um, and this was a real, this has been a real issue, including things like food fraud, where the deliberate substitution or misrepresentation of food and ingredients. <coughs> food fraud has existed throughout history, but it's never been addressed explicitly by one big policy. So this is where the, the motivation came because we saw, okay, there were policies around how to produce agricultural products, but not how to think about food as a much larger system. And so this is what so you can take a look at that, but this is now I'm missing the slide. Hold on. It's out of order, but yeah. So here is now terrible to read, but maybe you can read this on the um, on Blackboard a bit better. So the idea was eventually uh, transferred from Food Secure Canada to the government of Canada who did actually ultimately create a food policy. Uh, this happened, I think, two years ago, and lots of people were very, very happy about this. And then, there, of course, there were plenty of things that were left out of the policy or that were not addressed. But the major elements of Canada's current food policy is increasing access to affordable food, improving health and food safety, 
conserving soil, water, and air, and growing more high quality food. So growing more is one of the perpetual um, challenges in sustainability. Is it about growing more? Is it about wasting less? We talked about that briefly two weeks ago. Uh, but then conservation of the environment, improving health and safety, and increasing access to affordable. It's about economic um, sustainability, about human health, and so the individual sustainability, about environmental sustainability, and growing more high quality food, which is a um, bit of a question because it's not necessarily uh, the obvious answer to our needs right now. So that's that one set of policies. At a different scale of things, <clears throat> the, in the city of Toronto had established a food policy council. And Laurie Stahlbrand, who's now a professor at George Brown College, was uh, leading the Toronto Food Policy Council for a while, for many years actually. And their main focuses were, were quite similar, but had some differences. So in the same way that I talked about George Brown's cannabis policy fitting within the federal and provincial policies around marijuana. There's also uh, Toronto's food policy had to fit within the Canadian food policy, but then maybe also make some more specific additions to it. And that's because the Toronto context is different than um, the national context. In this case, because it's a city, you see that there's a lot of malnourishment, which means that some people are underfed and some people are overfed. Uh, but in the Toronto food policy, they had five main focuses. One was the right to food. So that was very much in line with the FAO. That it should be healthy and sustainable. So that's about human bodies and also the environment. That the systems themselves need to be sustainable. So that's about a fair, uh, fair value and fair cost for food. That food and reconciliation was, was a key component. So reconciliating the code word for improving relationships between settler colonial people and indigenous and first nations people now this has been a theme in canada for a number of years now is the importance to make those relationships between indigenous people and non-indigenous people better because in, in the past they've been uh, very problematic <clears throat> and find more voices at the table so this this falls in line with the fao's idea about about creating policies where it's about including a lot of different voices and not just having a few policymakers make the decisions. So talked about a few definitions and these definitions very much tie into uh, <coughs> tie into the question of policy. Um, some of them are more relevant for a Toronto level policy like food insecurity. Food insecurity is real for all people in all places in that many people can be food insecure, that is they don't have access to adequate high quality food, um, either for economic reasons or because they live in a place where they can't get to a grocery store that has fresh food. So in an urban environment, a place that's, that doesn't have access to fresh food is called a food desert. And like a desert that's has no water in it, a food desert is a place, it's a geographic area, I'm just gonna clear this off, geographic area where residents have little access to affordable, healthful food, especially fresh fruits and vegetables, because that grocery store is too far from where they live. And generally we say if you live more than one kilometer away from a grocery store selling fresh fruits and vegetables, you live in a food desert. And so some food deserts are mostly in cities because if we, if we go into the country, obviously you're gonna be further away, but you would more likely have a vehicle if you're living in the country. But for those of us who live in cities without a car, um, if you have to walk more than a kilometer to get to a place where you can buy fresh food, that means that you live in a food desert. And so to Toronto Food Policy is also looking at establishing ways to overcome that. <coughs> Uh, I'll come back to community supported agriculture. That's a little bit off topic for the time being. But again, it's about making, uh, making food accessible in a city. So here's uh, this quote from Building Roots, which is a Toronto-based organization. Half of Toronto's residents do not live within one kilometer of a grocery store. That means half of Toronto's residents live in a food desert. 
And that's a pretty shocking number. That means that you either have to have access to a car or it's going to take you a much longer time to go and find fresh fruits and vegetables. And that should be part of any city's policy that all people have access to fresh food. So there are some responses that have come up to this, um, certainly in cities where uh, access to fresh food is, is challenging for a large number of people. This is a mobile food truck um, created by the organization Food Share. And this is basically like a small, a very mini farmer's market that drives around and can park in, say, a library's parking lot or a city street and sell fresh fruits and vegetables if that neighborhood is in a food desert. Um, same thing happened uh, at another location in Toronto in Regent Park, where these, what they're calling homegrown retailers, so people who are cooking fresh food in their homes are then able to sell it in a public space, uh, like at a market. But in this case, it's basically an outdoor food court that's been established by the city because Regent Park is one of the regions in Toronto um, that's considered a food desert. So I'm going to show you another video. I'm going to have you watch another video. Um, and this is about uh, another kind of response that took place in Moss Park, another part of, my, uh, part of Toronto that uh, was in some ways a food desert. So I will send you the link once again if I can find it. Oh, there it is. Um, so this is a link with a very short video. What is it? It's uh, two and a half minutes long. And in this video, it's a report on CTV News about the Moss Park market that was created. So as you're watching this video, think about what policies might have had to be created to support the existence of the market that's described. So there's the video link. Again, I'll turn off my audio and video and we'll regroup in about three minutes after everyone's watched the video.
All right, so I'm hoping most of you have finished <clears throat> watching that video. Um, what, and see if you can add some comments in the in the chat section here. What uh, what emerged for you in terms of um, recognition of how policy might play a role in creating something like the Moss Park market? What kind of policies would need to be in place for that market to exist? Hmm, thinking. So ordinarily, in at the city level, policies are put in place to uh, make it possible for businesses to operate in certain locations and not in other locations. Uh, policies are in place to, uh, let's see, what support different kinds of traffic patterns. Policies are put in place to allow some places to have electricity. Um, so I've just given you some examples, but what policies would need to be in place for the Moss Park market to exist and maybe to be uh, replicated in other parts of Toronto? Any ideas? Get your fingers typing. Silence. Yeah, how can they enforce health and profit? Yeah, okay, so uh, health and safety inspections, right? You'd have to have a policy uh, that extends the health and safety regulations of the city to that pop-up market. Now, it's only open three days a week. It's not like a grocery store that's open 24-7 or even that's open regular working hours seven days a week. So you'd have to have a policy in place that brings that market into the food safety inspection system and also have them recognize that it's an irregular, it's got irregular opening hours. So that would be a change. That would be something new that the city might have to address. And as I said, there are things like, um, <clears throat> like, like just in fact that it's a commercial operation in the parking lot of a residential space. It's a residential housing policy, uh, residential housing development. Um, so that parking lot is not presumably zoned as a commercial space. It's zoned as a parking space for uh, residents. So you'd have to change that policy and make it legal to sell in a non-commercial space. You'd have to maybe work with the housing development to have them approve the use of some of their parking space for, um, for the creation of that pop-up shop. Um, yeah, there would have to be funding, some kind of funding in place for that to run. So that might mean that this commercial business uh, has to fit within some sort of non-profit status in order to receive access to certain kinds of municipal or provincial funding. So funding policies might need to be adapted or changed um, to allow for this kind of business to exist. Um, one of the policies that probably was in place is that all commercial operations have to be wheelchair accessible. And so that policy already existed for other commercial businesses and these guys, the Moss Park Market, had to have the ramp built in order to make the front door accessible to people in wheelchairs. So that would have been a pre-existing policy that had to be incorporated into this thing. We'll move on from there, but you can start to understand how sort of solutions to problems that exist may not fit within the existing set of policies. And so that's why policies have to be changeable, even though they're, they're written down, they're communicated, they're put in place, they're reinforced or they're enforced, they also have to be adaptable at some point because things change. All right, I'm gonna move on from this. These are a couple of other slides you can take a look at later about other uh, in-city developments to address things like food deserts, the Black Creek Community Farm where food was being grown in the city, um, creating opportunities for community exchange and learning, but also creating opportunities for more access to fresh food in the city. So there's some quick, quickly, I just want to look at water and genetically modified organis organisms, because these are two major uh, food related issues that uh, closely link to food policies. So water, uh, we've talked about a couple of times as being, ab obviously it's absolutely integral to all agricultural production. Uh, water is also extensively used in food processing. 
Uh, a huge amount of wastewater goes out of our food processing factories. Uh, but then water also is a major input into, of course, all kinds of agriculture. In certain parts of the country, particularly in Canada's north and in First Nations territories, there are terrible problems with water, uh, where the water that's in either in the, the lakes and streams where the First Nations people are taking the water from, or from the wells, uh, or the system, water systems that, are, that have been dug in order to provide access, this water is very often poisoned by different chemical contaminants because of mining operations, because of agricultural operations, because of displaced uh, ecosystems, because of in industrial uh, extraction processes. So things like uh, pulp and paper plants, that is the places where wood is processed into paper, they're often in rural or northern regions where the, where the trees are growing. So you've got this pulp and paper plant put down in the middle of the countryside. It might be adjacent to a First Nations. And the chemicals that are used to turn wood into paper are very toxic. And so those, those chemicals often go into the groundwater or go into the surface water and poison the waterways of people living in the country. And those are very often, particularly in the North, uh, First Nations people. So there's this terrible situation in which First Nations, even those with water filtration and water processing systems, have undrinkable water. And there are some First Nations that have had an advisory to boil their water that have been in place for 30 years and nothing's being done about this. It's slowly coming to the attention of the government and it's being addressed, but it's one of the places where there's an enormous amount of inequity in water access. But water is an issue all around the world. And um, as some of you may know, in, um, it was in Johannesburg in South Africa last year, they basically just ran out of water and people were limited to a very small amount of water per day, not nearly enough to say flush the toilet, let alone bathe or uh, do much cooking. So it was, uh, it's a really critical situation and it's getting worse all around the world. Water is the new issue uh, of unsustainability that is absolutely present in pretty well every part of the country, as we're, particularly as we're witnessing a lot of climate change, which changes the ways that water flows on the planet uh, radically. So, <coughs> excuse me, um, other issues, uh, seafood exports, very often because seafood moves around the planet so much after it's been harvested, um, there are very, uh, there's very strong need for policies around that, not just about how much can be taken, but what can be taken um, and how it's transported. Um, so there are now also some standards like OceanWise, which you probably heard about in other classes, uh, which are certifications to make sure that the production of seafood follows sustainable guidelines. So these are policies that have been put in place both by individual organizations and governments. And I'm going to jump over Canada's food guide because I want to get onto sort of so sort of genetically modified food. So this film, there's a link. Uh, you don't need to watch it right now but I'll put it in the chat. And this is just the trailer for this movie called Modified. Um, <clears throat> I would suggest you just take a quick look at it. I'm not gonna spend time on it right now, but it gives you uh, some quick insights into the issue of genetically modified food um, and, and what's potentially useful about it, but what's also really problematic about it. So actually in Canada right now, there are many genetically modified foods that are being produced and sold. Um, the ones that we, the most obvious are corn. Corn is hugely genetically modified to make it highly productive for all of the things that corn is turned into. So that's corn syrup, corn starch, um, not, not whole corn that we're eating, but corn in modified forms, but also all sorts of the, what we call the inputs into processed food, things like maltodextrin and um, xanthan gum. And a lot of the additives to food to give it the right taste or texture come from corn. But sugar beets are GM, squash has been genetically modified, canola, which is an incredibly important seed for producing oil, almost all of it is genetically modified. Alfalfa, didn't know there's papaya being grown in Canada, but apparently papaya is also genetically modified. Soy is very, very much 
modified in most of its industrial production, as is cotton. And salmon, salmon, which was one of the very first genetically modified foods to be allowed for sale in Canada. And so a lot of, almost all of our farm salmon is genetically modified. And that's why it's so important in some places to promote the consumption of only of wild fish. So in 64 countries around the world, genetically modified foods have to be labeled. That's critical. Um, Canada is not yet one of them. And this is a real challenge. Um, so genetically modified food, it's made in order to make more productivity. Uh, so foods that grow faster, that ripen faster, that stay fresh longer. So a lot of things like uh, fruits and vegetables that are genetically modified, are, they're modified not only so that they'll be more productive in the field, but so that they will they'll decompose more slowly once they leave the field and go into production. And that's partly why they're there, but it's also partly for economic reasons, because if it's more productive, it'll be better for the producer in the long run, because they will be able to sell more food uh, and make more money. At the same time, genetically modified food hasn't been around very long in the history of humans, and we don't actually know what kind of effects it may have on human eaters. We also don't know what kind of effects it might have on other plants and animals in the wild. So will genetically modified foods interbreed with non-GM foods? So that's a kind of biological contamination that might happen because of GM food. And that's a big question because we just don't have enough data on it yet. Now, lots of food businesses that create genetically modified foods say, no, it's fine for human bodies. We've tested it. It's been approved. There's a policy in place. It's acceptable. And yet we actually just don't really know because it hasn't been around for long enough. Um, so this is why genetically modified food is a very complicated issue. Yes, it might help us produce more food, but it may have a lot of unintended circumstances as well. And then the last one, and this is just a sort of fascinating and upsetting uh, piece of information, is that almost all potatoes that are grown and sold in Canada are subjected to radiation. And that's a, they, they irradiate the food, generally with, with gamma rays, in order to, um, oh no, I'm sorry, with the beta particles, I guess. So beta particles and maybe gamma rays as well. And they do this to kill microorganisms. So it's a way of sort of present, preventing the food from rotting or decomposing before it makes it to market. Uh, it may also kill insects or other parasites or to slow the ripening or sprouting fresh fruits and vegetables. So, you know, when you buy a potato in the supermarket and it's already turning a little bit green and it's starting to sprout, that's because it's been exposed to sunlight and it's starting to grow again because a potato is effectively a giant seed for another potato plant. Radiation will stop that from happening. And that's, you know, a good thing in terms of allowing the food to be eaten and not wasted, but it's potentially a very negative thing because we are not <clears throat> entirely sure how that ionizing radiation has an effect on the nutritional quality of food and whether it turns the food into a mildly radioactive ingredient that then goes into our bodies. So this is one of these big questions. And again, because of the lack of time um, that this has been done for, there's not a great deal of clear data on what kind of effects it has on human health. And then finally, genetically modified salmon. So you can take a look at this link, Aqua Bounty. <clears throat> this is a claim that uh, genetically modified salmon are sustainable, safe, delicious, and inexpensive. And these are the questions that uh, we need to ask ourselves when we're making decisions about <clears throat> food purchasing. So again, coming back to your checklist assignment, um, is GM food sustainable or not sustainable? And in what ways is it sustainable or not sustainable? And well, how will you make decisions um, for your food business about whether or not you're going to incorporate GM food into that business. So take a look at that article and uh, see if it helps you make decisions for your checklist. <clears throat> All right, <clears throat> there goes my voice. Anyone got any questions at this time or a comment on any of this other than how depressing and discouraging all the subjects are? There will be some good news later on in the course. But I'm just going to take a pause now. We'll turn over to um, price and profit. But before we go on to that subject, I just want to check in and see, does anybody have anything they want to say at this point?
And if you want to say it out loud instead of using saying it in chat, feel free to turn on your mics and then say it and then turn your mic off again. All right, everyone who's taking a nap right now, put up your hand. Maybe not. <laughs> all right, good to know you're all awake. Hooray! <laughs> On my end, I just hear beep, 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 beep. Maybe you can hear it too. All right. Thanks for bearing with us. This is, uh, we'll see, we'll see how we get, how, how exhausted we are at the end of the next half hour. So now I want to do um, just a quick little exercise. This is, uh, thank you. Um, this is, uh, where is it? Share file. There we go. All right, moving into sustainability and profit. <clears throat> so profit keeps being this, uh, the issue that we bump up against a lot when it comes to sustainability. Um, you know, we, the, there's a long argument saying, I can't afford to buy organic food because it's too expensive. Organic food is generally considered to be more sustainable than non-organic food. And yet the price sometimes make it, makes it less accessible to consumers, to us. Um, but the problem is if we don't buy it, there won't be a market for it. And if we, there's no market for it, or if the market is, remains small, then the prices will stay high. So there's this kind of need in some ways as the consumer to invest in the organic market by purchasing organic food, which will make the organic market get bigger, which will bring the prices down. And that will make it economically more sustainable as well as environmentally more sustainable. But again, this is this problem is that the immediate behavior change, okay, I'm gonna go buy organic, doesn't pay off right away. It's not cheaper right away. It may take a couple of years, it may take many years for the organic market to grow big enough that it can actually be priced at the at a price point that's affordable to most people. So this is always this argument, I can't afford organic food, so I'm not gonna buy it, but that means you're not supporting the organic market either. And that's where this question always, always ends up with sustainability. Yeah, but sustainability costs more. And so what we're gonna try to look at is some ways that we can think about economics in food differently to make sustainability not cost more, but to make sustainability be seen as costing maybe less. Um, in the long term. But that's the question. It's, it's always going to be in the long term. So it's always going to be easier to make an unsustainable decision today because we don't see the benefits right away. Before we get into that, though, um, this is going to be the moment for this little quiz. Um, and this will, for those of you who have written the pledge assignment, you don't need to do the quiz. But if you want to do the quiz, I will take the better of the mark between the quiz and the, or all of the quizzes. There will be three of them over the course of the next three weeks. Um, and the, that mark can replace your quiz, your pledge assignment. You can also just do it because it's fun or it's entertaining, ha ha. Um, but uh, you're not required to do it if you've already done the pledge assignment because of the misunderstanding about it no longer being due. So let's dive into this quiz. It's gonna be three minutes to do it. It's, it should be very quick. Um, and it deals with some of the things that we've just, oh, sorry, yeah, okay. A little confusing is the comment. All right, so I'll go back to this. If you have written your pledge assignment, you do not need to do the in-class quizzes, so you know who you are. Um, I will then use your pledge assignment as the grade for that 15% of the course. If you have not done the pledge assignment, you are required to do the in-class quizzes and exercises in order to get that 15% of the mark. Uh, is that clearer? Second part of it is, if you did do the pledge assignment and you want to do the in-class quizzes or exercises, you're certainly welcome to, and then I will grade all of them and give you the better mark 
either the mark from the pledge assignment or the mark from the three in-class exercises. So you can do, so for those of you who have done the pledge assignment, feel free to do these in-class exercises, and then I will take the better of the mark between the two pieces. So it's just an opportunity to uh, maybe do some more work, but maybe better get, get a better grade. Is that clear to those of you who have done the pledge assignment? Yes, good. If it's not, say something. All right, yes, so the exercise will start now, yes. So what I'm gonna ask you to do is, um, on your device, um, respond to these three little quiz questions and email them to me, because at this point, it's too challenging to put it into Blackboard. So just uh, as a PDF or a doc or a Google document, you can send me a link, anything you want. Um, just write the answers down in some format. You can write them on paper and take a picture of them with your camera and email me the picture as long as it's readable. And just make sure that your name, yeah. Uh, no, we need to do it right now, actually, because it's. Um, I don't want you to spend too much time researching these questions. It's really just a quick little in-class exercise. Um, and then you'll email it to me right away. Um, if it comes in late, uh, I would, well, I don't want it to come in late because I want you to do it right now. So the answer is no, you cannot send it by the end of the day. You need to send it right now. Um, and yeah, and you can send it to me in any of these formats. And just make sure that if you're sending it to me in any format that doesn't come via email, put your name in the document so that I know who it is who sent me the answers there. <laughs> I'll get to the end of that sentence eventually. All right. So here's the quiz. So I'll give you three or five minutes to do it, and I'll explain what I mean, um, and then email me or uh, send me your, your responses right away. So we just talked about policy. And uh, Samuel, did you have a question? You raised your hand. You can even say it out loud if you want. Oh, okay. Um, sorry, I saw your hand was up. All right, so for the quiz, do these three things. List four key elements of creating a policy. And I mentioned some of them. We've talked about policy just through these last slides. But what does policy need for it to work? And then write in your own words, don't, don't copy and paste from the slides, but write in your own words a one-sentence description of sustainability. And then name, one word at a time, five different kinds of sustainability. So you don't need to write sentences, just five words that describe differences of sustainability. So all of these are, I think, quite straightforward questions. Some of them may be not so obvious, but anyway. So I'll be silent and give you a little bit of time. If you have questions, put them in the chat and I will answer in chat. And so go and then email me as soon as you've done it.
So it'll take another minute or so, and then take whatever time you need to uh, shoot that off to me an email. So in case you need that, just drop my email address in the uh, chat. Does anyone need more time? If you do, just raise your hand. Okay, take a couple more minutes. Yeah, so I'm starting to get uh, some emails in. I will cut it off there, so please email me right now whatever you've got, and we'll take it from there, and I'll review these in the next class. <clears throat> so there's a, again, I will, uh, I will not share it right now, but there's a, Kind of fun video to watch. It doesn't quite relate to this particular class, but I'll drop the link in there. You can take a look at that later. This is a video, <clears throat> a sort of a comic video about what's on screen right now, this idea of the natural effect and the, the challenge of calling food products natural, which is not something that falls under any kind of policy, although obviously there are lots of different labels that people put on their food. So you can take a look at that later. The main point about profit and sustainability is that, as this, this article from Fast Company, the business magazine, says, sustainability doesn't mean less profit, it means profit forever. And that's, that's the thing that, that is really critical to remember when we're talking about sustainability and profit. Generally, business models say, make as much money, as much profit as you can as quickly as possible. And that's because, let's see if I can get to the right slide. So on this slide, 
what is profit? Well, profit is the gross revenue minus your operating expenses. So if you can keep your operating expenses as low as possible and keep your income or your gross revenue as high as possible, that means you're increasing your profit. And that's, that's normal. That's the way we think. That's the way capitalism works. That's what we want to do, make as much money as possible. The problem when it comes to sustainability is very often if you're increasing your income, your gross revenue, and reducing your operating expenses, you might be making decisions that are less sustainable. So a simple way to think about this is, let's see, is these two definitions are maybe not that important to remember for the two terms. The simple way to think about it is a small amount of profitability over a long term is better than a lot of profitability in a very short term. Two ways to think about this. Say you have a business and you make $10 million in one year of profit. And you've done that by raising your prices really high and by treating your employees really badly, not giving them insurance, uh, wasting a lot of food, wasting a lot of water, and uh, putting a lot of garbage into the environment. So you haven't paid for a recycling company to come to your restaurant. You haven't paid for composting. Now, this isn't a place where it's not run by the cities. So you're reducing your costs, and you're increasing your profit, and you make $10 million in one year. But you've priced yourself out of business, and suddenly you've you realize you've disobeyed a lot of the policies of the place where you're running your business and you get shut down. So that allows you to have a one year profit of $10 million, but no profit thereafter because you're out of business. Then imagine a different kind of business where instead of making $10 million a year, you make $5 million a year in profit. And you do that because you've kept your prices low, so your income isn't as high, and you haven't taken all those shortcuts that are unsustainable, and you actually spent money on sustainability. But because of that, you develop a more solid customer base, you have the trust of your community, and you don't go out of business because you don't get shut down by the government for breaking all the policies. So then you got $5 million of income in the first year, but it means you're also operating again in the second year, maybe the third, and maybe your business lasts for 10 years, or it lasts forever. So after 10 years of the more sustainable business, you've got $5 million in profit a year, which is $50 million of profit over 10 years. For the business that was unsustainable, you might've made 10 million in the first year, but you've made zero in years two to 10. So your total profit over 10 years was 10 million, not 50 million. Now that's a very simplified example of how sustainable profits can ultimately in the long term mean more profit. But it's, it's, a, it's a way to think about how increasing sustainability might reduce profit in the short term, but it will increase it over the long term. And so the little economics terms that are on screen right now, neoclassical rule and constant capital rule, are two ways to think about sustainability and profit. <clears throat> in the first case, neoclassical rule describes a system in which we are dependent on the environment for two things. One is a source of inputs, of ingredients or resources. And then the second is as a sink or a dumping ground for outputs or waste. So in that sense, it's very much akin to the linear model that's described in the story of stuff, where the environment is used as a place where we extract resources, and then it's also used as a place where we dump our waste. And that's not sustainable. Clearly, it's not sustainable in large-scale industrial production. But it's just not sustainable if you think about it. You can't take a finite resource, suck it up, and dump your crap back into that resource, and expect to have any kind of sustainable business or world. A different way to think about economics, instead of that extraction and waste linear process, is what's called constant capital rule. And in that, you're basically living on the interest of an investment or resource without depleting the principal, which is the core resource. So in banking terms, 
if I put a million dollars into a savings account and I'm getting 5% interest on that account every year, that's what, $50,000 a year? Yes, all right. Uh, so a million dollars at 5% is $50,000 a year of income. So that's the interest. So with, let's see if I can write this down. So one million at 5% interest equals $50,000 a year. That's the interest on $1 million in this particular savings account. So in this case, the million is the investment or resource, and the 50,000 is the interest. If I live off of $50,000 every year, that one million will remain in the bank. And so I will have $50,000 year after year after year without, in this term, depleting the principal. Without, and in this case, the principal is the one million. So if I live off the interest, the principal remains there, and I keep having interest every year. I keep having $50,000 every year to spend. If instead I just had $1 million and I spent $50,000 every year without putting that in the bank, after the first year I'd have $950,000, then I'd have $900,000, then eight hundred fifty. dollars So in that sense, that's where the principal is being depleted every year because I'm spending it down. That's the banking model of constant capital rule. If we're talking about the environment, the equivalent would be I have an orchard of apple trees and all I sell every year are the apples that the trees produce, all I harvest and sell. So in that sense, the apples are the in, are the interest that those trees, the principal, produce every year, and they reproduce it in a sustainable way. If I started cutting down the apple trees and selling the wood to some uh, house building company, then there would be no trees, there would be no apples. So I'd be depleting the principal, that is, by cutting down the apple trees. Um, which is the core resource that I've got, rather than living just on the interest from that investment. So this is, again, it's a very simplified model of constant capital rule, but what it tells us is, if we live on what is produced by an agricultural system, rather than depleting the base investment, that's more sustainable, and that's the economically sustainable way to produce food, rather than suck up the resources, throw out the waste, and continually do that without actually paying attention to the primary resource, which is the principle, which is in fact in agriculture is the soil, it's the water, it's the labor, it's the seeds. So instead of buying those things every year, you need to make sure that you're taking care of those things from year to year so that they remain usable. So that's a very beginning idea about sustainability. In classical economics, as I said, the idea is make as much money and have as few costs. So that's this example of buy low, sell high. Have a low cost input and a high cost output. Keep your expenses low, and then as a business operator, raise the support, your price as high as the markets can handle, which is about supply and demand and competition. But that's maybe not the most sustainable way to do it. And Let's see, and that's how many countries measure their gross domestic product, which is a sign of their economic success. But as I'll show you in this video, and there's one more video to look at, Raj Patel, who is a very famous, oops. Almost every major breakthrough. Uh oh, hold on. <laughs> Got a video running and I don't know who's. There it is, sorry, shut that down. All right, so this video is by Raj Patel. He's a well-known, and very important uh, writer and thinker about food. Um, again, this is a very short video, just uh, four minutes long, but it's very important because it tells, describes how much 
actual cost there is in a hamburger. So say a hamburger costs only $5 to you. What Raj Patel is saying is there are actually a lot of hidden costs in that hamburger that someone else is paying for. It's just not you. So again, I'll give you five minutes to watch this video, and then we'll come back and talk about it and move towards the end of this class. And the link is now dropped into the chat. So watch that, and we'll see each other again, or I'll, you'll hear me again in, in five minutes.
Okay, so hoping that you have gotten through that video. <clears throat> I think a couple of things that are really notable in that, right at the beginning on the very first opening, opening screen, said the $200 hamburger. And that's basically what Raj Patel is saying is that in a $400, sorry, in a $4 hamburger that you buy at a fast food joint, there's actually probably about $200 worth of cost. That might be because some of the people who produced the food were underpaid or were enslaved and didn't receive any income. It might be because that food in consuming it leads in the long run to health problems in the large population. And that means costs of medical care. It may mean cost of un work lost because someone's in the hospital rather than working. It might mean um, other issues related to that. It might mean questions about all the people who have not been paid fairly for their transportation. Um, as we saw somewhere <clears throat> a while ago, I forget now when, probably week two, there is about a liter, or 750 milliliters anyway, of petroleum product in every fast food hamburger. And that's just because there's so much petroleum that goes into making beef and grains and all the things that we eat. And so this idea that there's petroleum hidden in the cost of a hamburger also starts to get to this point that every hamburger that we eat doesn't actually cost four or five dollars or ten dollars even. It has a huge number of costs that are hidden. And this is where we get to the idea of externalities. And I'll leave this, uh, you know, again, you can take a look at the link and have more detail about what an externality is. But basically, it's anything that is not accounted for in the stated costs of a given product or system. So externalities occur when producing or consuming something causes an impact on third parties not directly related to that transaction. So that means the cost of labor, the cost of environmental pollution, the cost of health care. All of these things um, are actually inside the product. We're just not paying for them with the dollar. But if you actually account for all those externalities, if you built them into the overall accounting and the budgeting for all of our food goods, we would discover one, that our food actually is costing us a whole lot more than we're paying. But it also allows us to get towards this idea of a closed loop or a circular system, which is what the, uh, Annie Leonard was talking about in the, the story of stuff that is trying to turn this linear system from extraction to through distribution to consumption and waste, turn it into more of a closed loop where all the externalities are part of that, including all the waste and all the garbage that we would normally be dumping. But it also includes more hidden things like human labor that hasn't been paid properly. So very often, I mean, many of you have worked in very low paid food jobs and those jobs remain badly paid because in some parts, in some ways, consumers expect our food to cost not very much. If the food's not going to cost too much, that means the labor to produce it has to also not cost very much. And that's why consistently food workers are paid less than many other people in industry, particularly people who work in, in quick serve food and hospitality. So this is really, you know, it's one of the challenges. And if you're interested in having a career in hospitality, you might want to start talking about the importance of making uh, making visible the externalities of food labor. So this is where we get to the, this idea of this term, true cost accountings. Yeah, no, externalities will always occur. The question was, won't they always occur? They do always occur, but becoming, as Raj Patel said, becoming more aware of them and then starting to actually bring them into the cost will start to shift the way that people are treated and the way that things cost. Um, now, our, we're not going to change the systems overnight by any means, but this is why you can't just throw up your hands and say, well, it's always going to be that way. You have to actually do more work. And this is where we get to, this is why this course exists, right? We're teaching you that some of these hidden costs shouldn't be hidden anymore. And maybe it isn't okay for our food to cost as little as it does. Maybe our values have shifted so problematically because we're, our governments think, okay, food should be, food costs should be kept low. We'll pay a lot in, in health care. Well, slowly governments are starting to realize that if you actually make food more accessible, more healthful, more, more, more available, more appropriate culturally, disease and, and, and health-related illness will go down 
which will reduce healthcare costs. So you can put more money into your food if you're not spending so much money on your healthcare. At the individual level, that's complicated, but at the, at the systems level, you know, that's why we try to create policies that address these, these imbalances. So that's, it's a slow process. That's why we have to learn about it slowly, and that's why we have to make slow changes. That's why sustainability is such a hard thing to see the benefits of right away. But in the long term, over generations, I'm talking, not in our lifetimes, um, that has to change, or, or we'll just, you know, we'll ruin ourselves. We're, we're already ruin our, ruining ourselves in the planet, uh, but it will get worse over time. So true cost accounting is the idea of, of accounting for all those externalities and making the hidden costs visible. Um, it may not always mean paying for them, but it means making them visible so that we're not blindly buying the $4 hamburger without knowing the impact that we're having. Um, so one of our roles, let's see if I can get there, is I may have just taken this light out. Okay, one of our roles as food professionals is to communicate about this, to tell the stories. Um, by by talking about it, by making it visible. Even if you don't make your house cost $200, making your consumers know that they are not paying the full cost of that hamburger maybe is one of the roles of a sustainable chef. So thinking about these things, doing what's good for the whole system rather than only what's good for you and your business um, will ultimately have an effect. And this is why I'm, I made this reference to the behaviors around COVID-19. Doing what's best for the whole system will be better for you as an individual in the long term. And in the case of, of, the, of the virus, isolating yourself for 14 days when you come back into the country will prevent other people from getting sick, will prevent the healthcare system from being overloaded, so that when you eventually need the healthcare system, whether or not you have the virus, it'll be there to take care of you. If for some reason you've produced by your Behaviors, not about you in the classroom, but like one. If you go around spreading your virus to some to a hundred other people, then the healthcare system might not be there for you when you need it. So even though you didn't think that small action had an effect, it actually does in the long term. And it's really hard to be aware of that when we're trying to make decisions for ourselves. So that's why we have to have this global vision, this, this systemic approach to food and to our responsibility in that system. So telling stories and being an advocate, being a teacher, becoming, you know, when you leave this classroom, you have the opportunity to take everything that you've learned and share it with your colleagues, with your customers, with your bosses, with everyone, so they can be more aware of what their role is also supporting more sustainability. So I'm gonna go through, I'm not gonna spend time on these slides, but I want you to be aware of them because for the checklist assignment, you need to create a mission statement for your food business. That's part of the assignment, is to not only come up with a business, but make a statement about what you believe your mission will be as a sustainable food professional in, in this business. So there's some links in here that I'll point you to. You should take a look at them before you start that assignment so that you can understand what a mission statement actually is and how it should sound. Um, they are, as it says on the slide, they involve critical thinking, so be critical as you're creating your mission statement. Don't say something that's too simplistic. Avoid jargon or buzzwords because the mission statements need to be clear to your audience, including in this case your, your teacher, what that mission is and how it will be achieved. And use clear language so that it's meaningful to people. So those two things sort of go together. But you want your, your core mission, sorry, your core values, but particularly your mission statement, to be understandable to your staff, to yourself, to your customers, to everybody. So this is why we want to keep them simple but powerful. So there are on this slide there are three there are a bunch of mission statements. This links to I'm just going to share this screen very briefly. Um, on LinkedIn, this is a kind of nice example of some mission statements that have been written by other organizations and critiques of those mission statements. So, you know, Chevron, a gas company, our company's foundation is built on our values which distinguish us and guide our actions. Socially responsible, protect the environment, benefit the communities. This is a gasoline company. All right, really? 
um, are these real mission statements or are these mission statements that are meant to sound good to consumers who aren't thinking very critically? Probably the latter. So look at those mission statements. You can find it from the link. Uh, get back to the screen. Come on. All right, there we go. So there are some mission statements, this link here. These mission statements is that LinkedIn link that I just showed you. But then there's some food specific mission statements that you can take a look at, Diana Seafood and Hooked, and then GFS, Cisco, and 100 Kilometer Foods, different food uh, suppliers, and see how you react to them. You may not agree with those mission statements. You may not find them compelling. It may sound like they're greenwashing or making up a good PR story. That's for you to determine. This is also a very useful tool, the Global Footprint Calculator. Um, again, I'll share my screen so you can see it somewhere. So this is, it's a, it's a fun little, well, application to play around with. Um, where you can figure out what your global footprint is in terms of the sustainability of the food. So if you say, I never eat animal-based products or I very often eat animal-based products, you can then learn how much, um, how much impact you have on the environment and you can make it more specific in different ways. So it's a fun application. It's, um, it's pretty simple to use, and it's a good way for you to learn a little bit more about how different food procurement uh, practices may have an effect on your food business's sustainability. All right. So, again, for the checklist assignment, we're up, getting close to wrapping up here. Um, here are some, uh, just some resources for you. Community-supported agriculture, restaurant-supported agriculture. These are some other ways that you can find uh, suppliers for your food business, some other ideas about how to find more, su more sustainable um, food ingredients when you get to that, pro that project. And the last thing I want to take a look at is this exercise. So this is one more kind of fun exercise. This is related to the idea of uh, everyone taking a fair share of a common resource without overusing it. And this is actually a chance for you to get some bonus points for your final grade. These are real bonus points, but there are some rules. And again, it will involve you emailing me. So once uh, you've made your decision on this exercise, email me right away. Don't consult with your colleagues. Don't have chats amongst yourselves because it's kind of a game. And the idea is that you're going to pick the number of bonus marks that you want to receive in the course. You can choose either zero, two, or six bonus points. So this is going to be added on to your final grade in this course. Here are the rules, though. If you choose zero and someone else chose six, your choice of zero will wipe out the person who chose six. And that's a good thing, because if more than 10% of the class chooses 6%, no one gets any bonus points. So say, for example, everyone chooses zero, everyone will get zero. If everyone chooses two, everyone will get two. If some people choose two and some people choose six, but more than 10% of you choose six, you all get zero. If some people choose two and six and then some people choose zero, and enough people choose zero that it erases enough of the sixes, then everyone gets what they chose. So this is a time for you to decide. Do you want to... Yeah, so more than, as, as Nicholas has said, more than 10% is about two or three of you. 
So if more than two or three of you pick 6%, everyone's going to get zero. If one of you picks 6% and everyone else picks two, that one person is going to get six. So you kind of have to decide, are you going to aim high and cross your fingers that you're the only one? Are you going to aim medium and hope that everybody else is also aiming medium and then you all get 2%? Or do you know that the world is selfish and that some people are going to pick 6% and you want to wipe them out, so you're going to pick zero as a strategic move? It's all up to you. So I'm going to ask you to do, yeah, no, okay, no, no texting about, um, about, about what you're going to do. You all have to keep the secret for now. And I will keep the core choices confidential, but I'll tell you, um, I'll, I'll tell you in the, uh, no worries, I'll tell you in the um, next class who got what or how many, how many points were given out. So for now it's confidential. Just email me right now um, with your student number. I'll, I'll see your name in the email, but you can send me your name, your student number, and whether you're choosing zero, two, or six percent. And the results will be revealed next week. And I'll tell you, last semester, I was surprised in two, situa two situations. So send that to me as soon as you can. Um, I'll hang around in the class. If you have any questions, uh, we can certainly chat some more. Um, if you've got concerns or questions about school as well, I have some information, but not very much. Most of the best communication is coming to you directly from the, from the college. But if you want to be around uh, for a bit and ask any questions or just talk about what's going on in your life, I'm here. Um, <laughs> yeah, so please send me your choice right now via email, name, student number, and your choice of 0, 2, or 6%. Yeah, good luck to everybody. Stay sane. Keep getting out into the air, but be by yourself. Do as much as you can to be well, eat well, get lots of risk, rest. Yeah, don't risk it. Who knows what will happen? <laughs> and thanks for bearing with me. If you have any suggestions about how this course can go better over, don't tell us, Matthew. Um, <laughs> if you have, yeah, everyone has to pick zero, two, or six percent. Uh, okay, so everyone pick zero, two, or six percent. And the slide that's up right now explains it. So if more than 10% of the class chooses 6%, nobody gets a bonus mark at all. So that's two or three people. Basically, if three people choose 6%, no one will get bonus points. If fewer than 10% of the class chooses 6%, you all get the number of points that you chose. So if you chose zero, you get zero. If you chose two, you get two. And if you chose six, you get six. If one of you, if say five of you choose 6%, and two of you choose 0%, those two zeros will wipe out two of the people who chose 6%. So they'll get zero, but maybe everybody else in the class will get two, and then a few people will get six. So it's really an exercise in deciding um, how selfish you want to be and how holistic or systemic you want to be, or whether you maybe want to be strategic and try to take out somebody who picked six. Nope. Did that explain it? Hope it does. Anyway, so email me your name, your student ID, and your uh, your points, the points that you want to get. Say more about what you mean, Nicholas. Ha! Well, that could be an addition. I'm going to leave it at this relatively simple model, but I, I think that's an interesting. No one chooses zero, we all got minus 2%. That could be a future. Don't tell us, Matthew. <laughs> uh, awesome. Anyway, that's it for the class. Um, once you've emailed, you're free to right away and do whatever else you've got to do with your day. Yeah, and as I was saying, if you have suggestions for making this class a little bit more um, coherent online. I'm all ears. We've been sharing a lot of ideas among the instructors, but there's lots to be learned. So if you've got uh, other instructors who are doing things better or easier or more coherently, let me know. <laughs> oh, yeah.
Yeah, don't forget to email me. Don't put it in the chat. Don't tell me in the chat. Just tell me in email. <laughs> so if, if everybody does the checklist assignment, everybody gets 6%. If nobody does the checklist assignment, everybody gets 0%. Yeah, the game, yeah. Yes, exactly. If everybody chooses 2%, everybody gets 2%. But then maybe there's some people who aren't going to follow that rule. If you all agree 2%, and then two people like, three people like Jacob say, yeah, I want six. <laughs> We're all poker players in the world. Risky move, risky move. Don't tell us. <laughs> It works a lot ba better, this exercise, when it's in class with paper. And I can make you all be quiet and just hand me the paper, fold it up. Yeah, well, we'll see. It's a lesson in collectivity and sustainability. All right, folks. Well, if there's nothing, um, if you don't have questions uh, about any of the work or um, or just general questions about how to get through this bizarre situation that we're all in, I'm going to close this classroom. But I will hang out um, in Blackboard. There's if you go into the uh, BB Collaborate section. The course room is just unlocked, so I'll go hang out in there for a while. Um, and you can come join me in there if you have anything you want to say or anything you want to check in about. But for now, I'm going to shut this down, shut down the recording, and post it up uh, later on. So take care of yourselves and see you. OK, uh, Ismail, come, in, come into the other room, and um, I'll explain it to you again. Um, you're basically just picking. Zero, two, or six percent. Who wrote on my blackboard? I'm going to erase that. Um, and then, um, then I'll be giving you bonus points at the end of time. Anyway, see you again next week. And stop, stop. I'm going to control this. No writing on the screen. All right. Good to see you all. Good to see your names anyway. Check you next week. Good luck. Take care. Okay, bye. Bye.